Mr. Osborne, are you all right? Hey guys, welcome back to Games to Go, where we review games from all generations, both physical and digital. And today, I wanted to take a closer look at Spider-Man 1 for the PlayStation 2. I haven't played this game in maybe 10 or 15 years, so I thought it'd be a good time to go back and check it out since Spider-Man 2 is dropping on the PS5 in late October. So let's not waste any time and take a quicker look at this box art. As you can see here, we have the box art for the game with the Spider-Man coming down the side. And then we've got, you know, the Spider-Man mask right on it. I thought it would have been cool if they could put Green Goblin like in the eye. But some might have been some might have been mad if that was actually there because it could be considered spoilers. So I see why they didn't. If you flip it and you turn it sideways, you can see that it says Spider-Man right there. We turn it on the back here. You can see that it says Spider-Man again with Spider-Man and Green Goblin duking it out with a little preview paragraph along the side saying bitten by genetically engineered spider high school student peter parker is empowered with supernatural abilities including spider sense web slinging while crawling assume the role of parker as he adapts to his new powers and becomes spider-man but beware the city's villains will be pleased to see a new hero on the scene and then it's got these three squares right here kind of just going over like the three gameplay aspects of it saying defend the city from the clutches of evil with all new combat moves and dizzying airborne acrobatics Move through the st stunning scenes from the movie as you explore enormous city environments with newfound maneuverability and battle the toughest villains including Shocker, Vulture, and the Green Goblin. Seeing this kind of shocks me as I'm surprised they listed the villains on the back of the cover because I feel like that's definitely spoilery but I guess back then people didn't care. So let's just open this up and as you can see we got the disc right here, nice blue cover, nice finish and then we've got the manual. I miss these booklets so much. As you as you can see, the outside is in color. Now, if we open up the inside, it's got this advertisement for the strategy guide in the back, and then it's got some of these gameplay tips, just general stuff. I do like how they went in depth with like the combat and each of like the combos and some of these other abilities. It just it really helps, especially when you're young, and it helps you understand how the game works and how it flows i just miss that devs do this stuff man this is just such cool stuff they're so these books are so detailed for its time it's it's actually insane but let me put that back in there and that about does it for the case so there's the box art for the game let's move on to the story so if you've seen the movie which i'm assuming if you click this video then you most definitely have the story is based off the events that occurred throughout the film with some extra fluff added in to make the game longer. What I thought was interesting was how you start off playing as Peter as you search for Uncle Ben's killer. For some reason, I thought you played a little bit before that part, but to my surprise you receive a recap of the wrestling match versus Bonesaw and the robbery soon after. When you're scouring the rooftops fighting Skull gang members, it reminded me of Never Saw Spider-Man 1 for the PlayStation 1 as going from rooftop to rooftop fighting enemies was all too familiar. We eventually find our way to the warehouse where we hunt down and find Uncle Ben's killer. This game did a good job at depicting what happened in the movie at the most important times. Oh. Oh. No, Hugh! Not you! Stay back! I'm warning you, you psycho! We could have stopped you at the fight promoter's office. I could have saved Uncle Ben. Like they could have had us actually kill Uncle Ben's killer instead of having him trip out the window like they did in the movie. Decisions like this really just made it feel like you were going through the actual movie even though you were playing the game. It was great to see Norman Osborn outside of the suit and inside the lab trying to develop the super soldier serum. The models in this game are far from perfect but they're good enough that you can tell which character was which. Going through this story, I actually found myself wondering when Goblin was going to show up, because I couldn't remember at which point he actually entered the game. With us fighting Shocker, Vulture, and Scorpion, I started to realize that I actually didn't remember anything about this game. Now, me not remembering a lot I didn't think was a bad thing, I was just shocked by how I couldn't remember anything. It really has just been that long. Too bad Peter had to work. Yeah, I'm just glad you're here. 
I can't wait for my dad to meet you. Oh, Harry. After defeating this handful of villains, we finally fight Goblin for the first time at the Oscorp Unity Day Festival, which is a memorable moment from the movie and that fight definitely doesn't disappoint. This fight felt like it lasted forever though, as after saving MJ you fight Goblin for a good minute until he offers Spider-Man to join him. By this point in the story, I was wondering how much longer we had left to go since we had already fought multiple villains in Goblin once. But once again, this game surprised me as we traveled to Oscorp to investigate a piece of Goblin's equipment. Before I continue on with this story, I've gotta say that this Oscorp laboratory section is by far the hardest part in this game. If you played this game before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I digress. Even though this wasn't in the movie, I thought it was cool to actually find out that Oscorp contains secret labs for making chemical weapons and a giant robot, making the trek through the level worth it after all. At the end of our time at Oscorp, we discover that Goblin knows about MJ after seeing the photograph of them kissing. To nobody's surprise, Goblin then decides to kidnap her. What a day. What the? Tough day at the office, huh? We finally arrive at the final battle where we save MJ and fight Goblin. One interesting difference is that the entire sequence plays out on the bridge instead of going to the abandoned building where Goblin eventually dies. Now one part I did think was funny is that when Goblin calls in the glider to hit Spider-Man, when it hits Goblin instead, it just takes him all the way across the bridge. It, he just he just flies. I just thought that was so funny as when in the movie, it just hits him and he just goes right up against the wall. A nice little change, but it's still funny nonetheless. Mr. Osborne, why? Surprised? Yes, I suppose you would be. But the best surprise is still to come. After Norman dies, MJ then kisses us without removing the mask, which was weird, and then the game was over, with Peter telling us to go outside and play. Since the story is based off the movie, there isn't much that comes as a surprise, but it was nice to see the additional story beats with the villains that added to the overall world. I thought the balance and tone was done well too, as it was always serious with what everything was going on, but the dialogue between Peter and the villains along with the terrible voice acting by everyone not named Willem Dafoe actually made this game even more enjoyable. But nonetheless, let's move on to the gameplay. Now one thing I do have to say is that this game is very hard. It doesn't matter who you're fighting, where you're fighting them, how much health you have, what moves you think you know, you can get swarmed by enemies like that and just die instantly. And then to make matters worse, Goblin is like a freaking Mortal Kombat character. He knows all these freaking uh, fancy moves and flips and kicks and it's hard to even close the distance and, and fight him. But nonetheless, let's just go into this gameplay and I'll explain further. The normal enemies aren't difficult one on one, but if they swarm you, it can get rough. They take more damage than you would think, and you can't just focus on one enemy, you have to keep track of what they're all doing just to make sure you can survive. What helped me was performing the two web moves by pressing triangle and the left or right directional buttons. If you moved it to the left, you sprayed webbing on your fist making punches a lot stronger. If you moved it to the right, you would create a web dome, which would put you in a protective shield and blast the enemies around you, perfect for dealing with the crowds. Normally, it would take a couple combos to defeat the enemies, but with these web fists, they go down after one or two hits. Now, they do take a second or two to charge up, but if you're able to find the time to actually charge these, then you can use them effectively in almost every fight. The Shocker, Vulture, and Scorpion boss fights were all unique, and I appreciated that each fight served as some sort of buildup that led to the final confrontation. 
When you're in the train station trying to dodge Shocker's blast, it made you think quick so you could time where you had to be so you knew you would have the opportunity to move. His actual fight wasn't too hard as you could either just punch away or just wait for him to tire himself out and then just go in and inflict some damage. Vulture was another cool villain I didn't expect to show up either. And let me tell you something, climbing up Vulture's tower was a huge pain. It wasn't enough that the tower was on fire, there was missing parts on the stairs so you had to go in every direction in order to ascend to the top. And on top of that, there were the drones that would follow you and explode if you got too close. After all that struggling getting to the top of the tower, once we finally get there, Vulture just flies out. This led us to a chase sequence in the Vulture boss fight. This boss fight really emphasized the amount of effort the devs put into the aerial combat because I was impressed with how much fun it was to fight in the air. Obviously, it's not really fast or fluid, but you could see signs of what the air combat would become with your ability to not only web from above, but perform combos as well. Now, this next part had me kind of confused because here we are running into Scorpion and I'm thinking, all right, bring it, Scorpion, what's up? And then we end up protecting him. Having to protect Scorpion just felt weird, but not in a bad way, more like uncharted territory. It was refreshing to actually protect a villain instead of fighting them for once, even if it was just for one level. Once we do fight Scorpion, he was even harder than the previous two fights, as he doesn't just hit you with his tail, he can dash across the station and perform what looks like hyper beam attacks. What made this fight so frustrating is that the beam attacks were deadly accurate, being able to hit you even if you were swinging in different directions. How I managed to win was taking the objects around the area and just throwing them at him until he ran out of health. You can try getting in close and hitting him, but I don't see how you'll survive. So now, let's finally discuss the worst level in the game, Oscorp. This level can be so frustrating at times, so bad to the point that I could see players dropping the game because of how annoying it is. First off, you have to be stealthy the whole time so you can't be seen by anybody that could raise the alarm. So, me being me, I'm thinking, man I'm just gonna swing right through it. I don't care about no alarm, these guards can't catch me. Man that was a mistake, because it turns out that the guards that were patrolling each area are actually super soldiers because they take a lot more hits than normal enemies and if you didn't finish them fast, they would run to the alarm box and alert these annoying robots. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have nightmares about these robots as when they come after you, they swarm you. It's not just one, it can be like five or more with more spawning as you enter each room. The lasers that shoot at you deal great damage and they take a couple hits to kill making them a huge pain to get rid of. Now there is a way out of this if you're patient, which I'm not. If you hide in the shadows, your mask will turn black, indicating that you can't be seen. So if you're able to hide in the dark while the alarm is raised, then the robots won't be able to spot you. But of course, if you hide in the dark near the robots, they will just see right through it and kill you anyways. But wait, it gets even worse. The map layout of Oscorp is literally a giant maze making this even more difficult. It's not just a couple of hallways, there are various rooms and doors leading to different objects and enemies that could ruin your whole run if you're not paying attention. Having to navigate this building while being stealthy and avoiding everyone in there, it was just tedious. And if I replay this game again, best believe I'm using cheat codes to skip this entire section. And finally, we fight Goblin. Twice. Hey fool, I've offered you the world and you've thrown it away. Well. Wow. I'll cure you of your deluded ideals soon enough. Save it. You're done. <laughs> That's what you think. I've arranged for a little parting gift. The first fight at the Unity Day Festival showed me that Goblin is no joke. When you fight him in the air, he moves really fast on the glider and is constantly going back and forth on the screen while throwing pumpkin bombs and those flying bat things that could just cut you up. I forget what they're called, but these things. Then, when you get him on the ground, the fights are even more difficult, as trying to land a hit on this man is damn near impossible. As soon as you get close to him, he would just punch and kick you first, or grab you and throw you around, or pick you up and choke the life out you. What worked for me was doing nothing but kicks as it seemed to break his usual attack pattern and allowed me to get a combo or two in. I'll say this again, if you're playing this game on hero or superhero, kudos to you because you're a beast, because I couldn't do it. I just played this game on normal and it was still really, really hard. 
It doesn't matter where you're fighting Goblin, in the sky or on the ground, you better buckle in for a tough fight because he doesn't pull any punches. Because of the difficulty, it was very satisfying to see Goblin get impaled with that glider because at that point, I was just happy the fight was over. The gameplay for this game is drastically improved over the PS1 Spider-Man games and it's clear that this game laid the foundation for how the combat would eventually become in the more recent installment of Spider-Man games. Now this game does have some replayability as there are some cool extras that are worth checking out after you beat the game. You can choose to do this legit or through the secret shop, but regardless, you can play as other characters other than Spider-Man. By far the best character to play as was Green Goblin, as if you start up a mission when you're outside the city, you can use his glider to fly around and attack the thugs on top of the buildings, as well as jump off the glider and fight them one on one. Goblin has his own moveset and can run extremely fast, making him just as much fun or even more fun than Spider-Man. It was really cool that the devs let him become a playable character after you beat the game. Shocker is playable as well, but he doesn't have any different attacks. It's pretty much just a Shocker skin, but you use Spider-Man's abilities, which is pretty weird to see. There is a production art section where you can view various concept arts for the game, including characters, environments, and iconic moments shown throughout the story. Overall, this game was so much fun to revisit and was just as fun as I remember as a kid. Outside of the Oscorp level, there really wasn't anything I disliked about the game. Every aspect of the game, from the combat to the cutscenes and the story, they were improved from the older games, making for a solid adaptation of the 2002 film. For those reasons, I'm going to give this game an 8 out of 10. If you're a fan of Spider-Man and have a way to play this game, I would recommend giving this a playthrough, as it's a short game, but it's definitely worth your time. What did you think about Spider-Man 1 for the PlayStation 2? Did you even play this game at all? Do you think it's a little bit dated? Let me know in the comment section below and if you enjoyed this video feel free to drop a like or subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.